There's a, there's a huge age range in this sure. audience, sure. and it's a reminder that uh, surgery is a lifelong, a precious journey. Dr. Pevick. Thank you. Okay, then I can't walk away. Okay. We're going to do a few technical things here. But before we start, this is, I took a walk in Nepal a few months ago, and this is a photograph I took of Mount Everest uh, with a little Canon pocket camera. And Dr. Farmer asked, actually wanted me to give a talk based on this walk, but I didn't think that was scientific enough, so I chose something else. This works. Let's try this. So, that's okay. So instead, I'm going to talk about getting older. No, I did it. Thanks, Terry. I'm talking about getting older, and uh, getting older is not for the weak, and it's also not very good for your arteries. <laughs> so these are the disclosures, and I don't have any. Um, today is the oldest you've ever been and the youngest you'll ever be again. Kind of a sobering thought, but it's actually true. And uh, we think about the disadvantage of getting older, but this is where we are. The, uh, the demographics in this country are changing dramatically in large part because of the baby boom generation, which is generation I'm a member of and many of our faculty are a member of. And we can see that back in the 1960s, there's this glut of young people in this country. But as the decades go on, we're seeing just not long from now, there's going to be a very large demographic of people starting to get into the uh, older age groups. And that last slide was up to 2020. If we look out to 2035, there are going to be millions of people in the 80 to 90 range. And there's even going to be a pretty good cluster of folks uh, by 2060 who are in the 90 plus range. So this is a, a group of a uh, population that we've really not experienced before. And it's going to change what we see as physicians. Um, and this is a problem. You always want to grow up when you're a kid, but it's a trap. Um, in addition to the population bulge with the baby boomers, also life expectancy is increasing. We all know based over the last 100 years, 200 years, that life expectancy has changed. But even in recent years, this is from the uh, World Bank. And just looking over basically the last decade from 2004 to 2013, this gray line is life expectancy in the United States. And it's increasing up towards 80. But even in a world at large uh, population, life expectancy is increasing also. So we are getting uh, older as a national population and as a world population. And because of these two combined factors, the, uh, this demographic bulge of people born right after World War II and increasing life expectancy, the number of old people in this country is, uh, become, is growing faster than any other segment of the population. And this is looking at the blue bars here are people aged 65 to 84. And then the yellow is actually the very old patients over 85. And this is the numbers in millions. And we're right here, right between 2000 and 2020. And you can see that the population of patients 65 to 85 is growing dramatically and is going to be a very large part of the population. And the greater than 85 year olds is going to be 15 million people in 2040 who are over age 85. So this is going to be a very large segment of the US population. And this is from the US Census Bureau. So again, there are going to be more and more older Americans, and it's because of the aging of the baby boom generation and also because of increased life expectancy. Why do I care about this? Because what I take care of for a living is, in large part, a disease of the elderly. So this looks at the age-dependent prevalence of peripheral arterial disease. You can see not a very common disease under the age of 60, but by age uh, 75, 20 to 25 percent of people will have peripheral arterial disease, and this is a disease that is of both men and women with an equal distribution. You can see uh, below age 65, it's primarily uh, a male dominant disease, but after age 65, women catch up, and this is a big factor for both men and women, and as they get older. So as our population uh, gets older, we're going to see more and more folks with arterial occlusive disease. A couple of guys sitting on a bench. My, my wife said, what are you doing today? I said, nothing. She said, you did that yesterday. I said, I wasn't finished. <laughs> so I'm going to change in and talk a little bit about pattern recognition, because that's one of, the, uh, one of the things I want to present here today. So if you look at the slide, I think anybody looking at this slide 
sees a triangle. But there's no triangle there. There's actually just these three little Pac-Men here with a little cutout for their mouth. But when you arrange them in that pattern, our eye sees what we want to see, and we see a triangle in the middle of those three circles. Similarly, when you look at this pattern, it's really hard not to see a square here in the middle. But there actually is no square there. But our eye will we'll devise that because that's what we want to see. Do you see anything wrong with this? Nothing wrong there, right? Turns out there is. But it's really hard to see that because, again, our eye sees what we expect to see. So we've known for a long, long period of time that people who smoke tend to get significant atherosclerotic disease located in the aortoiliac segment. That's something we as vascular specialists have come to ex expect when we see a patient with a long history of smoking. And we also know that if we see a patient with diabetes mellitus, there tends to be a significant distribution of bad atherosclerosis in the arteries below the knee. Patterns that we've come to uh, expect and we manage our patients with these expectations because of these known patterns. This is a, a paper that we wrote. Uh, uh, Jared Hilton was a medical student when he started working on this. He's now one of the anesthesia residents here. Caitlin Smith helped us with this. Uh, it's published electronically, but not yet uh, in press. And this is based on a pattern that uh, I thought I was detecting in the patients that we take care of. We're seeing more and more elderly patients in our population, as I mentioned. And I got the impression that we're seeing a different pattern of disease in the older folks. So what we did is we looked through several years of our uh, experience with low extreme arteriography. We looked at patients who had complete arteriograms from the aorta down into the feet. We found about 300 patients who had that pattern. And we described infrapopetial diseases, patients who had at least 50% narrowing or occlusion of one popetial artery. And severe infrapopetial artery disease are patients who had involvement of two or more arteries just to the popetial artery. And one thing that we notice first when we look at this population of patients, and this is comparing patients under 70 to patients greater than 80, we found that we tended to do their arteriogram more for claudication in the younger population, 36% versus 19%, and more for tissue loss uh, in the elderly folks, 63% versus 45%. So a little bit of skewed distribution. We tended probably to either defer looking on older people until they had worse disease, or maybe they had worse disease, don't know, because this was a retrospective study. And so also, also the doctors had their own selection biases. But then we looked at patients with infrapopetial artery disease, because it was my impression that these patients who came in frequently without any history of smoking or diabetes had a pattern that looked like diabetic disease. And sure enough, that's what we found. If we looked at patients who had infrapopetial artery disease under the age of 80, only 5% of those patients had no history of smoking and no history of diabetes. Well, as a full, a thir a full third, 30% of the people over 80 had never smoked, had no diabetes, and had pretty significant uh, pattern of disease of atherosclerosis of the arteries just of the popteal artery. Uh, that was highly statistically significant and fit with uh, my uh, personal observation. And if you look at, uh, look at the same data in a different way as an odds ratio, your chances of having infrapopetial disease if you're over 80 compared to if you're under 70, eight and a half times more likely that you never smoked or, or never had diabetes if you were over 80. And for severe infrapopetial artery disease, the chances, the likelihood of you having severe infrapopetial artery disease without smoking, without diabetes, was 11 and, a half, 11 and a half times greater than younger patients. So this clearly suggested that patients over the age of 80 do have a propensity to develop severe atherosclerosis distal of the popteal arteries. And just to clean it up a little bit, we looked at just the subgroup of patients who had critical limb ischemia, rest pain or tissue loss, the patterns of disease that are associated with limb loss, and the same pattern hold true. If you had critical limb ischemia and infrapopteal disease, virtually everybody under 70 either was a smoker or had diabetes, but at least a quarter of the patients over age 80 uh, had the infrapopteal disease and critical limb ischemia with no history of smoking and no history of diabetes. So a different pattern of disease than we previously had recognized. We did a receiver optic characteristic curves to figure out. We arbitrarily chose 80 as our cut point. It was our better cut point. And based on that, we were pretty close. We found that 76 and a half years seemed to be the age 
cut off for patients who are more likely to have infrapopteal disease without any history of smoking, without history of diabetes. So I would recommend that we start recognizing another pattern to look for for occlusive disease. In patients over age 77 or 80, we should expect that they have a significant risk of having severe infrapopteal occlusive disease, whether or not they had a history of diabetes or smoking. So another demographic we're seeing, in addition to our, a, a larger group of older patients and patients living longer, is people in this country are smoking less. And this is uh, from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. And just look at the green line. The green line is the percent of the population who smoke cigarettes. And back in 1965, almost half the population smoked. Back now to, up to 2011, as down to about 20% of the population. So a significant decrease in the number of people who smoke in the United States, which is a good thing, unless you're a vascular surgeon. So fewer patients are smoking, and the population is getting older. So the very old, patients over 80, even patients over 90, up to 100, are going to be a bigger and bigger proportion of the patients we're all seeing. And what we found is that older people get rotten arteries below the knee, even if they've never had diabetes or smoking. So we need to think about this with, in a population we previously would have thought were not at risk for this kind of disease. And we also know that blockage of the arteries below the popteal artery is a pattern that's associated with a high risk for limb loss, and it's also more difficult to treat. So there's a lot of ramifications to this pattern of disease in this population. Why do I think this is important? I think it's important even more for primary care doctors. So primary care doctors are faced with the problem of seeing a whole bunch of patients come to them with a whole bunch of different symptoms. They have to figure out what's wrong with them. See, a lot of people with, force, with sore feet, a lot of people maybe with little sores on their feet, and typically I'm afraid that a primary care doctor who sees a patient who never smoked, doesn't, doesn't have diabetes, who's got a pain in their foot is going to say, well, you've got plantar fasciitis, you've got a little sore on your foot, so your shoes are too tight might miss this. So it's going to be very important for the primary care doctors to understand that patients over the age of 80 at high risk to have severe arterial disease even if they never smoked and if they don't have diabetes. And since fewer people are smoking, the very elderly are going to be a bigger and bigger uh, proportion of the patients that we as vascular specialists see. And so it's going to be important for us to recognize this pattern of disease because the pattern of disease affects how we treat the patients life stages in bottles. So as we get older, we go from the baby bottle to the Coke bottle, hopefully not Budweiser, and then the IV bottle. <laughs> Another problem. So we know, we think, we know that old people get really bad arteries, even if they've not done anything wrong. They don't have diabetes. They never smoked. Uh, so they get this parent disease that is threatening to their limb, but old folks don't do very well with major limb amputations. This is a, an old study, but a frequently quoted study uh, from Mark Naylor out of University of Colorado from 2003. And he looked at 154 patients with 170 amputations, uh, kind of evenly distributed between above and below knee. Most of the patients, 87%, had their amputations for critical limb ischemia and about 13% for diabetes. And what I pull out of this paper for this talk is if you look at the patients who don't walk after a major amputation. Pretty high for this population patients no matter what, but under 75, about half of patients don't walk. Over age 75, 80% of the patients don't walk. So if you're old and you got blood, disease, blood vessel disease and you get an amputation, you're not very likely to walk ever again, which is a big deal. This is a bigger uh, study from 2005, 500 patients, again, uh, fairly equally uh, distributed above and below knee amputations, and 90% of the patients with had their amputations for arterial disease. And also looked at the influence of age. And this table is looking at the prediction of whether or not the patient's ever even going to wear a prosthetic limb. And what the authors found that if your age was greater than 70 when you had the amputation, you were three times more likely than younger patients never even to be fitted with a prosthetic leg. And this is from the same paper looking at the likelihood of worsening, uh, worsening uh, ambulatory status or failure to ambulate at all. And again, age over 70 was a significant predictor, two and a half times less likely to, uh, to walk at all or to have decreased ability to get around after major amputation. So another paper suggesting that patients do poorly functionally after amputations. 
And finally, this is one out of the uh, rehabilitation literature. This is looking at patients who actually all receive prosthetic limbs. Uh, and what these authors found was that, first of all, patients who are old rarely even get a leg. Only about half the patients get a prosthetic leg. But they looked at patients who actually had received prosthetic limbs and asked if they could walk 500 meters. The authors chose 500 meters because that's what they figure that allows you to actually be functional in the community. You can go to the store if you can walk 500 meters. And what this, this study, it's a busy slide, but it's basically looking at the ability to walk 500 meters versus age. And as you can see, for all these parameters, the likelihood of being able to walk a functional distance decreases dramatically with age. This is trans tibial amputation or below the knee amputation. Only about a third of patients who actually got fitted with prosthesis are able to functionally walk. And it drops to about 30% for patients at above the knee amputations at age 85. So age is a poor predictor of uh, being able to walk even if you're fitted with a prosthetic leg. And most patients don't even get that far to get fitted. So it's a problem. So old people get bad arterial disease, even without the standard risk factors. Old people do not do well with amputations, but we need to do something because unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, old people do keep living. And this is from uh, uh, the United Kingdom and looking at a large cohort of patients and found that for men who made it to age 80, their life expectancy from that point on was another eight years. And if they made it to 90, they still had another four years of life and even longer for women. For women who made it to 80, they were going to likely to live another 10 years. If they made it to 90, likely to live another five years. So the elderly do, if you make it to be elderly, you're likely to keep living for a good while longer. So this leaves us with a conundrum. So what do we do we, with the octogenarian who comes in with ischemic foot ulcers and has severe infopopular artery occlusive disease, which is what we commonly see? So one thing we can do is we can do surgical bypasses. And this is traditionally what we've done for these folks. And it turns out, depending on how you look at it, they actually work pretty well or they don't work pretty well. This is an old study, and I've included this in a lot of talks because I think it's really, it, it really was one of the papers that helped us as vascular surgeons start to look more at patient-centered outcomes. And this was a, a, a follow-up of 112 patients who had vein bypasses for critical limb ischemia. And based on, and this was from 1988, this is an old study, and based on what we considered the, the standard outcomes at that time, these patients did great. Their assisted primary patency, which means the graft stayed open, maybe with another intervention, help keep it open, was 77% at five years. So at five years, three quarters of them still had a patent graft, and 85% of them still had the limb. So we said, this is great. And about three quarters, two thirds, three quarters of them still could walk and were still independent. But that came at a price. A quarter of the patients at some point developed a significant wound complication requiring uh, further hospitalization and management. Half the patients required repeat operations to either treat their wounds or keep the graft open or maybe treat the uh, contralateral limb. And the average patient had one and a half operations. And a quarter of the patients ultimately required a major amputation either on that limb or on another limb. So if they looked at that population where three quarters of the patients looked great by the traditional parameters, only 16% or one in six had what we really wanted, an uncomplicated operation with no recurrent symptoms, good function, and no further operations. So bypasses, patients pay a price to have an arterial bypass, and that price is a pretty severe one to pay if you're 85 or 90 years old. So this is what prompted our specialty to start looking at other options. And this is a, uh, the, the best, also getting to be an old start, a study now, the best study we have to date on looking at endovascular versus open surgical treatment for, for critical limb ischemia. And this study was uh, a European study and they randomized patients who had critical limb ischemia, so either uh, ischemic breast pain or tissue loss, to either surgical bypass first or balloon angioplasty first. And it was only balloon angioplasty, they did not include any other interventions. And this is basically the, uh, the important conclusion. They looked at amputation-free survival as the primary outcome. And in the dark blue line is the patients had angioplasty first. The light blue line is the patients had surgery first. And the amputation-free survival was pretty much the same for both groups, suggesting that we can treat critical limb ischemia with endovascular techniques. This is just looking at outcomes of, uh, uh, for procedures over time. And the blue 
1998, the red is 2007. And this is looking at mortality for low extremity procedures. And if you just kind of look at the general trends with time, the blue 1998, the red 2007, whether you're looking at amputation, uh, open uh, bypass, endovascular reconstruction, things have gotten better from 2007 to 1998. So that suggests that we're doing a better job taking care of folks. But if you look at the endovascular versus the open, the outcomes are better, either were better in 1998 and better in 2007 in terms of mortality. So there may, this, this is further pushed the impetus to want to use endovascular techniques on our patients. This is a very interesting slide. This is looking, this is from a, a sample of the, the national inpatient sample, which is where you look at basically a, a administrative database that's a sampling of 20% of the hospitals in the country and see what's going on. And this was comparing 1998 through 2006. And what the, the author found is that over that period of time, open lower extremity bypasses have decreased in uh, uh, frequency where the endovascular reconstructions have rapidly increased. And interestingly, the number of major amputations has decreased. Correlation does not imply causation, so you can't say that amputations are going down because of this trend. But I think that may, there may be something to that. I think there probably is a correlation. If you add up the total number of procedures being done, 1998 uh, was about 180,000, 60 plus 120. And then in 2006, it's about 200,000, 80 plus 120. So more procedures are being done. And I suspect we're starting to intervene on more patients who in the past, intervene with endovascular treatments, patients in the past who said we're too sick for, for a, a bypass. And that's probably why the amputations are going down. So we know that old people have bad arteries. We know that old people don't do well with amputations. Uh, and we get the impression that endovascular therapy is maybe better than uh, open therapy, at least for frail patients. So the question is, does endovascular therapy work in this difficult pattern of disease that old folks got? Does it work for intrapopsial disease? And this is a paper published actually this year in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. This is out of our vascular center here also. Goggin Singh is one of the interventional cardiology fellows, and uh, he wrote this paper based on the uh, results from our vascular center. It's actually the largest paper to date looking at interventions for intrapopsial arteries. And it looked at 187 patients, all with critical limb ischemia, and 41% of patients had a totally occluded arteries. And most of those patients, that was the only runoff artery they had. So these are patients with bad disease. Uh, again, just looking at the intrapopsial arteries. And on average, about one and a half arteries were treated per patient. And look at the outcomes by patency. OK, it's really not all that good. So this is just one year outcome for patients who had stenotic intrapopsial arteries. A one year primary patency, that means staying open without having to do anything else, was about 40%. As far as that were totally included, only 30%. So not all that great. But if you look at secondary patency, which means uh, those arteries stayed open after a second intervention, a little bit better, up to about 50% at one year for the uh, stenosis and about 40% for the occlusions. But if you look at limb salvage, again, these are all patients with critical limb ischemia, so you'd expect they're at high risk for amputation without intervention. And it turns out the ones that failed the intervention at one year, 40% of those patients had lost their limbs. Ones who had successful uh, uh, angioplasty for uh, stenosis, 92% oh, still had their limb. And for ones who had total occlusion, 75% still had their limb. So suggesting even though the patency rates aren't perfect, these interventions do seem to help salvage lower extremities, suggesting that uh, angioplasty works for the infrapopular arteries. And there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do for arteries. So is angioplasty alone the right answer, or should we be doing other things for the tibial arteries? So this is a paper from last year looking at angioplasty versus stenting or atherectomy for the tibial arteries. Uh, review of 2,000 patients with either angioplasty alone, angioplasty plus atherectomy, which means to physically remove the plaque with a catheter, versus angioplasty and stenting. And as their endpoint, they used amputation. And what they found, the stippled is patients with just simple balloon angioplasty. The black is angioplasty with stents. And the solid gray is angioplasty plus atherectomy. And we looked at the amputations at 30 days, 60 days, and one year. There was no difference between the various techniques, suggesting that angioplasty alone in this arterial bed 
is probably adequate treatment. And finally, there is a, a, a newer technology that's a balloon technology coming out with drug eluting balloons, where you put an anti metabolite drug on the surface of the balloon. The theory is that when you inflate the balloon, that drug gets pushed into the intima of the artery and might help decrease the risk of restenosis. And this is a randomized single center trial looking at only diabetic patients with critical limb ischemia, means uh, breast pain or tissue loss, and only with uh, relatively long stenoses or occlusions of the arteries distal to the knee. And if you look at just the plain, this is, this is the, uh, this is a, a kind of a crummy endpoint. This is target lesion revascularization. Means how likely is that that same spot's going to need to be treated again? And this is a drug eluting balloon and the plain balloons at about a year. And you can see the drug eluting balloons, they were less likely to get re intervened on, well, fewer than 10% versus about 25% uh, with plain balloons, suggesting that this technology might have some benefit for the arteries below the knee and probably a better endpoint, ulcer healing. So the patients who had ulcers, 85% with the drug eluting, drug eluting balloon healed, as opposed to 65% with a plain balloon. So clinical endpoint. And then also looking at restenosis of the treated artery, 27% with drug eluting balloon versus 75% with a plain balloon. And reocclusion, 18% uh, with the drug eluting balloon versus 55% with a plain balloon, suggesting there may be something to this technology in this location. And so I just went back just to see what, what my own personal experience is. I arbitrarily looked at 10 years ago versus the last year and looked at my patients who were having lower extremity interventions for critical limb ischemia. And 10 years ago, they were virtually all open operations and currently in that now, about uh, three quarters or, or maybe 80% of what I do now is endovascular for these lesions. So uh, we, have, we have bought into these uh, concepts here as well. So I think this really does work. So yeah, am I getting older? Is the supermarket playing great music? Um, <laughs> probably a little bit of both. So, so in conclusion, primarily the population is aging. And the population is aging because of the demographics, the baby boom generation, which is our, our, our biggest uh, population group is getting uh, older and life expectancy is increasing. As we mentioned, peripheral arterial disease is common in the elderly uh, and for patients over the age of 80, they can develop severe disease of the arteries below the knee without the typical risk factors of smoking and diabetes. And we know that that pattern of the disease, the severe disease in the arteries below the knee, is significantly associated with loss of limb without intervention. And we know that the, uh, the elderly patients do very poorly after amputation. And we think that endovascular interventions are preferable in general and certainly for the old frail population. And it seems that balloon angioplasty alone salvages limbs with infrapopteal artery disease. So I would suggest that as the population ages, we need to diagnose and treat their severe disease. We need to recognize this, both primary care doctors and specialists. And I don't have data to support this, but I think it's this population uh, where are the endovascular uh, revolution is having its greatest effect. So back when I came here, we frequently would see a patient who was 88 years old with an ischemic ulcer on the foot. So that patient's too frail to undergo a six-hour autogenous vein bypass. So we try to carry that patient through as long as we could. Their pain would get bad, their foot would get infected, we do an amputation, and then they would not thrive. Whereas now we're treating more and more of these patients early on with endovascular therapy, saving limbs, and I think this is really where we're having the, 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 the best effect of this, uh, this te these techniques. So that's, I, I do have a few more things. I've shown a lot of sobering pieces of data, and this is something I found a little less sobering. So this is a, a, a graph showing the number of breweries in the United States. And you can see that we've got a critically low number here back in the 1980s, but fortunately back to where we were 125 years ago. So that's, those are some good data. And uh, just to continue talking about aging, uh, Dr. Farmer, for some reason, was really interested when she heard the title of my talk, because I didn't think she thought there was going to be something boring about blood vessels. So there's going to be interesting about aging. So I've got some, uh, some examples of what aging does to people. So this is our president in uh, 2008 and 2014. Kind of rough. And this is our, 
our Dr. Robert Cantor, then and now. And uh, <laughs> talk about sobering, Dr. Holcroft, then and still a few years ago. But then I realized why Dr. Farmer was excited about this, because this is Dr. Farmer a few years back and Dr. Farmer now. So she's actually getting better as she ages. <laughs> but I think even more remarkable than that is Dr. David Wisner, who doesn't age. <laughs> And then, and then finally, so Dr. Farmer did want to sh might, might be show a little travel log. So there's just a few images from my walk in Nepal. And this is, uh, you go over a bunch of suspension bridges, and this was actually the highest one. And you don't even see the bottom of the valley here, but to give you some perspective, those are yaks, and those are people. So it's kind of up there, and you have to trust the Nepalese engineers. <laughs> and this, these are just some... some Pretty photographs. This is a mountain called Amade Blanc, which I thought was one of the prettier mountains up in the Himalaya. And uh, these chortons, these uh, Buddhist shrines, are frequently built at various locations just along the trail. And just another view of uh, Amade Blanc. And this is uh, this is us uh, getting up into the higher regions of the, above the tree line in the, the Kumbu Valley. These are our yaks carrying our bags for us. And that's me at the Everest Base Camp and a porter going past the Chorton on the way back down. And this is what the villages look like below the tree line, actually a, a remarkably beautiful place uh, where you get down into the less, less hostile weather, a uh, Buddhist temple built into the side of the mountain. And this is in uh, Patan, which is one of the old ancient uh, capitals, one of the former kingdoms in Nepal. Thank you. Questions? And I can't tell you how Dr. Farmer does it. It's magic. Dr. Farmer. Dr. Farmer, so thank you very much. Um, you uh, lived up to all of my expectations, which didn't surprise me at all. Uh, my question, you didn't talk too much about um, prevention relative to peripheral artery disease. And you've made the observation that there appears to be a different trend, that those below me problems in the non-smoker, non-diabetics, are they also Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And that's actually the pattern we're seeing are patients, the, the healthy elderly, which is completely different. So throughout our careers, we've seen the patient who amazingly makes it to 75 or 80 years old with diabetes, who smoked and looks very unhealthy and isn't healthy. He has kidney failure and uh, uh, may or may not have obesity, just not very good self-care. But we're seeing patients who are 85 years old, never been on a medicine, I've got a guy who, up he's 87 years old, and I'm actually going to operate on him in a couple weeks, who hikes seven or eight miles a day up in the mountains, and previously, a couple years ago, was hiking 15 or 20 miles a day. Uh, we're seeing these patients who are fit, really have no medical history whatsoever, and are coming in with bad ischemic tissue loss on their feet. Very, very different population than I remember seeing at all 15 or 20 years ago. And so you ask, what about prevention? This is a population where it really seems to be senescent arteries. This is just, I think, part of the aging pattern. These patients, they get very calcified arteries, so not only is it infrapoptio, but they've got diffuse calcification. We've not looked at that yet, but it's something else I'd be interested to look at, because it really looks like the pattern of disease of kidney failure and diabetes without any of those diseases. And people who are not fat, are not, who, are, who have been very active, out driving their cars, living their lives, who are coming in with limb-threatening ischemia. So I think it's a very different pattern of disease, something we don't really know about, because our traditional recommendations of quitting smoking, controlling diabetes, is not staying active is not going to help these people. So whether it's cholesterol met metabolism, that might be an effect, a factor, I don't know, because no one was paying attention to that 30 or 40 years ago, or whether this is just part of the aging process, just like your joints wear out, your arteries wear out. Um, I suspect it's a ladder. I suspect there's not going to be a whole lot we can do to prevent this but we're going to need to recognize this uh, in these patients, and the treatments are different. Joe? So as you break off, especially you know, travel pictures, but it, it does prompt the idea as, as the world population uh, ages outside of the U.S. culture, and you take it, other than diabetes and smoking, there's a lot of other inflammatory promoting activities that we engage in that we don't think of as, as, as that, such as diet, et cetera. Are there anything, does anything look at Shirley's Dr. Marion outside of the U.S. culture? 
future and if they get this senescent uh, arterial degeneration in the lower extremities or um, is there a potential that it is some other inflammatory mechanism in our cultural um, society that, that creates this? That's a really good question. In case you didn't hear Dr. Galante's question, is it something else in U.S. or Western type society, lifestyle, diet, that leads to this pattern of disease. I cannot answer that because no one, as far as I can tell, no one else has looked at this. This is, uh, we actually scoured the literature before starting on this project to see if anybody had noticed this pattern. I've not found anything. There's certainly age is a risk factor for a lot of stuff, and it's, it's mixed in with other studies, but looking at specifically uh, as a risk factor outside of the traditional risk factors, I could find nothing. So I don't think anybody's looked at that whether this is a phenomenon just in Western societies or this type of uh, 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 culture, I don't know. I suspect that's going to be hard to find because certainly in a more third world culture, there aren't a whole lot of people making it to 80, into the 80s yet, just because of other things that get them at earlier ages. So getting very old and staying relatively healthy is, I think, a fringe benefit of living in a very developed society. So it's going to probably be pretty hard to tease those things out. But those are going to be important questions as are there things that we can do to help people when they're 20, 30, 40 from getting in this wicket when they're 80. I don't know. And there may there's, there's, there are a lot of questions still, more questions than answers. It's really interesting to look at the China studies because they collected a lot of data on uh, patients population and they looked at the risk factors for all the different Old age, yeah. Where are, those, where are those studies? I've not seen those. Uh, they're, they're actually, they're infected in the early 80s, and they're actually in the books because they were so large. Got it. And so, so that, that's a good question. That's a good point. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that, and that's something that I may not be able to answer. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah